The Frontline Podcast is brought to you by Legion Technologies. Hourly employees want and need flexibility and predictability. They desire more connection and belonging with their peers and companies. And businesses want to maximize productivity while enhancing employee engagement to reduce turnover. Who said we can't have it all? The Frontline Podcast is focused on discussing the challenges that come along with having an hourly workforce and shedding light on these important employees who are so often overlooked. You'll hear from leaders bringing transformational and innovative change to their organizations and ways you can improve your own experience and the experiences of your employees, no matter where you sit in your organization. At Legion, we believe that AI-powered workforce management solves these challenges. I'm your host, Tracy Chernoff, Director of Employee Engagement at Legion Technologies and the host of the podcast, Bringing the Human Back to Human Resources. Be sure to subscribe to the Frontline Podcast so you're the first to hear our bi-weekly episodes, which will come out every other Thursday. Learn more at legion.co, follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn, and get ready to be part of the solution. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Frontline Podcast. Thank you so much for being here for another episode. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, leave a comment wherever you are listening to or watching this podcast. Our guest this week is Karen Mangia, and she is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author and one of the most sought after thought leaders in the world. She's the author of four different books, Success from Anywhere, Create Your Own Future of Work from the Inside Out, Working from Home, Making the New Normal Work for You, Listen Up, how to tune in to customers and turn down the noise, and also success with less. She's been featured in Forbes and also regularly contributes to Thrive Global, Authority Magazine, and ZDNet. Thinkers360 named her number nine on their list of global thought leaders and influencers on health and wellness, number 12 for mental health, and one of the top 150 B2B thought leaders to follow. As Vice President of Customer and Market Insights at Salesforce, Karen engages current and future customers around the world to discover new ways of creating success and growth together. She leads the company's work from home task force and is shaping the strategy for the workplace of the future globally. She's passionate about diversity and inclusion, and so she serves on the company's racial equality and justice task force. And prior to Salesforce, she spearheaded customer experience at Cisco Systems. So I'm super, super excited for you to hear this episode with Karen today. Again, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Head to our show notes as well to learn more not only about the show and Legion Technologies, but also Karen Mangia. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Karen. Karen, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Frontline Podcast. Thank you for being here. I love being here. It's like finding a bunch of friends I didn't know I had. Oh, I like the way you put that. Well, we're excited to have you and we're excited to get this conversation going. So I'm going to jump right into it. Um, First, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. So tell us about yourself. Who are you? Where are you currently located and what do you do? I am currently located in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I am a Wall Street Journal bestselling author and an executive at Salesforce. And I think I have one of the coolest jobs ever because I get to spend time with our customers and also studying the market on topics that our customers and what we hope our future customers will care about. And for me, that looks like the future of work. I mean, that's a boring topic. Nothing's changing there. Right. The future of customer engagement, customer experience and customer success, and then a lot about equity in the world and in the workplace. And as we study and listen to what's on the minds of organizations of all sizes and leaders of all kinds, that influences how we build our products, uh, what we bring to market in terms of our narrative, and also the thought leadership that we release. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And, And actually, to expand on this so we can get to know you even more, do you mind sharing a little bit about your career journey and how you got to where you are today? It's funny because you know how sometimes you see your career path more clearly in retrospect. Yes, thousand percent. Yeah, than when you're going through the crossroads. And I was thinking about this the other day. When I was in university, I had a job working for a professor, and he did research each year for the Radio and Television News Directors Association. 
That took the form of a survey that he would send out to radio and television news directors across the country. And my job was to call and follow up with the non-respondents to that survey and offer to administer the survey over the phone, send another copy. And then when we would get these surveys back, you know, we would analyze the data, you know, not just the numbers, but the comments. And then he would author about six articles a year for their magazine. And I co-authored one each year with him. And so that got me thinking that when I graduated from university, that I was going to go work for Nielsen, right? The big research and ratings company. Unfortunately, I hadn't done my research because when I did, I discovered they were headquartered in Iowa. And as a university student, that didn't sound exciting to me. <laughs> so my career took a different path. You know, I think about it as a trilogy in a sense, AT&T, then Cisco, and then Salesforce. And along the way with all of my roles, spending time with customers and understanding what they care about has been my true North star. And that's taken the form of sales and sales leadership, channels and strategic alliances, and voice of the customer and customer experience. And it wasn't until I was leading the customer experience program globally at Cisco that I realized I did kind of have that research job at Nielsen. It just happened to be called, you know, customer experience leader, and it happened to be in tech, fundamentally the same concept though, you know, doing research, listening, turning what we heard into narratives that influenced our go-to-market strategy. And so for me, I would say, as I've thought about my career at each step, a couple of constants, one, stay close to customers, mm. second, be a storyteller. And then each time I'm feeling like, Maybe I'm not growing in a role anymore. I get that antsy feeling we all get yes. from time to time. I think about education, experience, and exposure. So what do I want to learn next? Who do I want to meet next? And what might I want to try next? Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm sure that many of the listeners will be really interested to hear that story because, you know, growth and our career trajectories, they are so different sometimes than what we expect them to look like. So um, I really appreciate you sharing that. And, and uh, it gives me a lot to think about just as, as we continue on these discussions as, you know, regarding um, the experience for employees and what, and, and how everything is kind of changed but also stayed the same and so i know we'll get into this a little bit um in this discussion which i'm going to kick us right off into these questions that we have for you because after getting connected with you a, a few months ago and having the opportunity to learn from you and connect with you uh one-on-one -on -one, I, I know you're going to have a lot of amazing tidbits to share so something that you and i have spoken about at length really in previous conversations is this idea around agency over our lives and the gift of choice. Can you walk us through um, how this influences employee experience and retention? Choice is the most coveted benefit in the workplace right now. And when I think about these somewhat sensational headlines of the great resignation or reshuffle or reconsideration, whatever term resonates, what people are often looking for is more flexibility, autonomy, and choice. I mean, that's kind of the story behind the headlines. And I think about this time that we're living in right now and getting to that agency as an opportunity to close the gap between what employees expect and what employers are willing to offer. Hmm. And the, the center point there is a set of choices. And understanding those choices begins with listening deeply to your employees, right? Where do they want more choice? What choices do they see? It makes it possible then for leaders to step away and say, hey, in light of this, where might we be willing to offer those choices and what might some of those choices be? One of my favorite examples of this is General Mills. They, like most companies, have regular employee 
pulse surveys that increased in frequency when the pandemic was at its peak. And of course, at General Mills, these were the people producing the products that we were willing to kill strangers in the grocery store for, right? The flour, the cereal, because we were all going to be on the Great British Baking Show together, right? And so, of course, they heard their employees saying, we're burnt out, we're feeling a high degree of anxiety. And so the well-intentioned leaders at General Mills did what I see many organizations doing. They rolled out additional PTO. They were shocked when fewer than 8% of their 10,000 employees opted in to that PTO. So of course, burnout continued to be high and they did two things that were really smart. First, they stepped back and got more curious. They did some deep employee listening. Why didn't you take the PTO? What's happening? What would look like a benefit to you? You know, tell us more about the burnout. Why are you burnout? Is it just work? Is it something else? Then they came back to their employees after doing some work with an organization that studies brain science and brain chemistry, what motivates all of us. And they went back to their employees, same 10,000 in 2021, and they said, you're burnt out. We hear you. That's why we're rolling out the gift of choice program. Now within 24 hours, 85% of their employees had opted into the gift of choice program. They knew they were onto something. I mean, 8% opt in to 85% opt in. Now, in the gift of choice program, the employees were offered three choices. And these choices, by the way, resulted from listening to their employees. The three choices were more PTO, more pay, literal cash, or the donation to a not for profit of your choosing. What do you think the number one choice was among those employees? More PTO, more pay, or the not for profit donation? You would think more pay. It was more PTO. Hmm. And here's why I love this example. The employer got to the outcome they wanted by offering a choice rather than a mandate. The brain science behind this is when we are offered, especially unexpectedly, a set of choices that we view as favorable, it lights up all these great things in our brain that say, wow, I feel great. I feel seen. I feel heard. I love it here. This is so refreshing. And I think about that example. I mean, the choices resulted from them listening to employees and then stepping away and saying, what would we be willing to offer? Now, the reality is those three choices were budget neutral to the organization. Hmm. At the end of the day, the feeling of having a choice significantly moved the needle on both burnout, employee experience and employee loyalty. And I think what might be possible for all of us if we use choice as a tool and as a means to look in the direction of meaning rather than mandates. Hmm. I love this point and I, I want to carry this sentiment through into this next question because this podcast is super focused on bringing attention to hourly employees especially and, and some of the challenges that are unique to being an hourly worker. And you may know this already, but hourly employees make up 58% of working eligible Americans. So the majority of working eligible Americans are earning their income on an hourly basis. And they can sometimes be lost in the midst of business decisions. And I think this story about General Mills and this, this gift of choice and how we empower employees is so powerful because I think so often when we make decisions, we're not always thinking about how giving a person the freedom to choose, giving them that uh, agency, as you say, over their experience and their lives can result in the end result that you're driving for. So can you elaborate on what businesses can do to more consciously empower their, their hourly employees especially? After about 600 one-on-one -on -one interviews with leaders about the future of work, you know, how employers and employees are reworking work together. One example stands out very clearly in my mind of what's possible to keep frontline workers top of mind and considering wellness, mm -hmm. right, as a part of the experience. And that's Frito-Lay. I was fortunate to interview the chief HR officer there, and I was blown away 
by the wellness programs and benefits that they roll out. And they designed specifically for drivers of their trucks. Mm. Those people we see on the road, I mean, think about how many miles someone delivering your Frito-Lay snacks, oh probably logging, how much sitting that is, what your pay is most likely looking like at the end of the day, what your quality of life is in that mm. kind of context. And some of their examples are not just, you know, progressive milestone raises, it's wellness programs that are targeted specifically at those workers. Financial wellness benefits were one of the top ones, showing people, you know, how to allocate that money, doing and using technology to give wellness nudges of, have you stood up? You know, are you engaged? I mean, there is a front and center employee first mentality and they did what I think is very smart. You know, we think about innovation or solving some of these big employee experience problems as, you know, we've gotten some data usually from an employee pearl survey and our lived experience of interacting with employees, which tends mm -hmm. to be a small group and therefore isn't a representative sample usually. Right. And then we think our role as leaders is to craft something and roll it back out. Innovation actually happens from the furthest point out you know, your end point of who you serve back into the organization, not from the problem you see out. Mm. And so they did deep listening and they followed around and did ride alongs with these drivers and people who were stocking shelves. They started solving for the choice, for the new benefits programs, for the wellness programs from the furthest point out, which was hourly workers truck drivers, people who stock shelves, then the people in their manufacturing plants making the snacks, all the way back into the knowledge workers in the organization who had much more choice and for whom we tend to think of designing programs first or it's more relatable to our lived experience. Mm, that's super interesting. And actually it does um, segue really nicely into this next point around um, engaging and motivating teams. and. You know, so if we shift gears a bit on this, I know that, you know, personally, yeah. you've shared a lot of resources around ownership and how instilling ownership and autonomy can be super, super powerful to engaging and motivating teams. And so with this example that you've shared with Frito-Lays, I think it's it's kind of the perfect way for us to talk about this. But really thinking through the lens of the hourly workforce, how can managers, whether it's in retail, hospitality, um, the food industry, whatever we think about there, how can these leaders create ownership on autonomy for their employees who may be at the more detailed level of the business and the organizational structure? Would you say it's harder or less hard to do with an hourly team? Leadership is listening and thinking about what our employees are in a position to own or how they can help us identify our blind spots begins with listening. Mm. We just need to be asking perhaps some different questions. One of my favorites is what might we be missing? Your frontline employees see things inside of your business that create supply chain disruption, value disruption, opportunities to be more efficient, effective, productive, deliver a better customer experience. What might we be missing is a question that opens up the conversation and is framed from the lens that the person asking the question acknowledges they don't know everything there is to know mm -hmm. about that employee's experience or about what's happening. We all miss things. Second opportunity is the five minute fix. And here's what I love about the five minute fix. We talk in business so often about think big, act small, whether mm -hmm. that's solving for burnout in your organization, employee retention, talent attraction, customer experience, whatever that looks like inside of your organization. And this applies on a personal level as well. This could be, you know, getting more fit or losing 25 pounds. You know, we all see this big outcome that we desire and where we get stuck is it's so big that we think we need grand gestures to realize that outcome. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're burnt out, you don't just need a day off, you need a month off, right? <laughs> if you're trying to solve for burnout in your organization, you know, you need $500 million, right? To go solve this. And the five minute fix says, 
how can we think big, act small? You know, I say, what can we do with five people, five dollars in five minutes? Mm. The beauty of the five minute fix is everyone can contribute an idea that would take just five minutes to try that would move you closer toward that goal. So if it is we're struggling with burnout, maybe one five minute fix is we we push each day at a certain time and end of day alarm bell to people that something fun and comical. It takes five minutes to watch. Well, then we see, do people actually stop working? Maybe it's, I, I've got another organization that, that they do their uh, Friday five minute wrap up where they congratulate people on the wins of the week. And that's the message that sends people into the weekend, hmm. you know, with recognition and acknowledgement. Whatever it is, five minutes of investment is a time increment we can all find. We can all contribute ideas that would take five minutes it also helps you build momentum because you either fail quickly and abandon the idea or you realize something about it worked and it moves you closer toward that big outcome. The real genius is five minute fixes build momentum. And even if you only made a 1% improvement daily toward that big outcome, you would have doubled your progress in 72 days. Wow. Wow. You know, this is actually making me think about how what I can only imagine to be the, the stress surrounding some of the unionizing efforts around the U.S. especially because for businesses, there's a definitely a sentiment around unions sometimes because of the, the lack of that control that you have when a union gets involved. And so obviously this is a very loose um, explanation of what can happen when you know some people unionize versus others not unionizing and how that uh, labor model can really just completely change the the makeup of an organization, not necessarily for good or bad, but just in general. Um, and so that point that you shared there in terms of the five minute fix and, and and how those small wins can create these bigger outcomes um, without putting all this pressure on ourselves to solve major major milestones. Um, and I like that, that, you know, each each uh, milestone can be small or attainable or that five minute fix. So I love that. But thinking about this trend um, that we've seen with major, huge businesses in the United States, seeing unionizing efforts from their employees, considering all that we've discussed so far up until this point, what do you predict will be the next frontier for employee experience through agency and ownership? And I bring this up through the lens of unionizing because there are sentiments out there that unions don't allow for a ton of agency and ownership for the employee or the business. And there's a sentiment that it does. So I think it could be helpful to understand that this is the state right now for many employees across the country. But in general, again, what, what do you predict is the next frontier? Hurt people holler. Hurt people holler. I'll never forget sitting in a room with Van Jones. And whether you do or do not agree with his point of view, he's a pretty thought provoking person. And he said, hurt people holler. And it, mm. that came to mind with your question. Because anytime we feel the need to join together as one voice, it typically means we feel our individual voice is either not being heard or we are afraid to use it. Mm. When I look at any movement, this could be the Me Too movement. This could be the Black Lives Matter movement. This could be the unionization movement. This could be the Great Resignation movement. The message behind all of those movements of coming together to raise our voices about something we feel passionately about, what's behind that is, I do not feel seen, I do not feel heard. As a result of that, I feel I do not have agency and choice. And if there's an opportunity to join with a force bigger than myself, where maybe our voices are louder and we're more seen and we're more heard and therefore perhaps taken more seriously, this will lead to more choices. This isn't about you know, any one group versus any other group. I mean, the reality is this happens in organizations with knowledge workers as well, right? Look at what has happened at Uber 
or at Google with days of lockouts where employees are literally staging a strike. Look at the return to office mandates that are happening where the employees are refusing to turn, return to the office. That is a, a version of unionizing. It is a version of striking on the job in kind of a modern sense. The crux of the change that we need to see is a new leadership playbook. You know, when the power shifts from the employer to the employee, and when we have the kind of disruption that we've just lived through, people are feeling empowered to join together and demand the choices and the agency that are overdue in many categories of our working and living populations. Wow. This is a really interesting point. And, and actually, that was my, my last question in terms of our topic for today. But it definitely leaves me with a lot to think about. And I like that, that we need a new leadership playbook. And and I definitely agree on the points of, you know, how our voices play a role in these movements. And so thank you so much for sharing that perspective. I think it will um, hopefully everyone will have the same response as I did, where now our, our wheels are starting to turn and we're thinking about how we can really um, create the future that we see for ourselves and how we can use our voices and especially for those of us who are leaders, um, which everyone is a leader in their own right, but whether you're in the position or not, you have an opportunity to really um, affect the, the future and change the way that we understand the world of work to be. So thank you so much, Karen. And, and I will say that I have one final question for you, and we ask this of every guest, and that is, what is the best advice that you have received that you continue to live by? It could be work from a, a work-related situation or otherwise? Your life is not a dress rehearsal. I think about how many times we postpone joy, mm. happiness, peace, a dream, and we come up with all kinds of reasons. You know, that kind of job doesn't pay as well. What will people think of me? You know, what will I think of myself? It's too scary. And I was at a crossroads and feeling this big debate and internal struggle of taking the path that felt true to me versus what I felt was expected. And I was on this trajectory. And my very long time life coach looked at me and he said, hey, kid, this isn't a dress rehearsal. You get one chance. There are no do overs here. And that just stuck with me that success, happiness, peace are best when we give ourselves permission to have all of those wonderful experiences and feelings show up moment by moment. We don't have to put an appointment with happiness, success, peace, joy, and living our dreams out on the calendar sometime in the future, only to realize we never quite get there. The best opportunities when we feel at our best and most alive is when we are giving ourselves permission to be happy and content and aligned with our true calling and soul's desires right here, right now. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's definitely something that will stick with me. It's so true. There are no do-overs and we are certainly not living in a dress rehearsal. This is, this is every day. This is life. Thank you so much, Karen. And, and I will, in the show notes, I will add all of these amazing resources that you have on your website and that you've provided um, all of the, those who follow you as well as um, that you've provided me. So with that, is there anywhere that we can direct the listeners to connect with you other than your website and those free resources that you have? I'm very active on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So connect on the platform of your choosing. Amazing. Karen, thank you so much for being part of this podcast and for spending some time with us today. My pleasure. Great to be here. I wish you every success.